Hello and welcome back to The Professor Speaks. I'm Rafael Chacon, director of the Montana Museum of Art and Culture, and I'm also professor of art history and criticism at the University of Montana in the Western United States. It's a pleasure to welcome you back to our course on Roman and early Christian art. Today, we're gonna to be talking about a new dynasty. This is the Severan dynasty, which followed the Antonines. So bear with me as I begin our PowerPoint discussion. Let me share the screen and open up our PowerPoint. So we talk about a new dynasty. This is known as the Severan dynasty, which takes its name for, uh, from the Emperor Septimius Severus of uh, the family, the Severan family. But before we get to the Severans, we need to discuss a, an individual who is a transitional figure between the Antonines and the Severans. And that individual was a man by the name of Pertinax. Uh, Pertinax Publius Helvius Pertinax. Uh, born in Liguria, he rose through the ranks of the Antonines, and he is one of those, uh, one of those Praetorians who, um, who plotted against Commodus and ultimately uh, brought about his demise. In 193, he becomes emperor. He's declared emperor by the Senate, but unfortunately, um, he was murdered by the Praetorian uh, guard that, he, uh, that was supposed to protect him, actually. Uh, Pertinex had a very, very short rule of three months, and his death actually ended in a great civil war. So let me show you some coins with the image of Pertinax here. And then a, a series of coins that show some of the contenders, the individuals who uh, aspired to the Roman throne, uh, including people like Clodius Albinus, Didius Julianus, Pescenius Niger. All these individuals were a, a series of generals who, who fought each other for the right to rule and to uh, win over the, the hearts of the Romans and the hearts of the Senate. Um, the figure who came out victorious in this civil war was Septimius Severus, the man who lends his name now to the dynasty of the Severans. He was born in North Africa, and again, he's part of a series of emperors uh, after Trajan and Hadrian who were born in the provinces. In this case, he was born in Leptis Magna in North Africa. This is now modern day Libya. And he came from a distinguished senatorial, Roman senatorial family in the uh, African province. He married a woman from the Near East, a woman by the name of Julia Domna, uh, who was born in Homs, Syria, the ancient Emesa. And, uh, and she will be an important figure, obviously during his long reign, uh, but also in Roman history in general. Uh, during his, uh, his rise, he had been governor of Illyria and Pannonia, and, uh, and once he assumed the throne, he purged the Praetorian Guard, which was now this kind of wild card within the Roman state. Um, here's a portrait of him on the left now in Paris at the, um, at the, uh, the Louvre Museum, and here's another portrait of him in Munich. Uh, Septimius Severus entered Rome in the year 193, and he ruled until 211. He had a relatively long and prosperous reign. Um, among, the, uh, among one of the things that he did, in addition to purging the Praetorians, was to, uh, to remove the Damnatio Memoria that had been issued against Commodus after his assassination. Uh, so it, it, it seems that what he was doing here was ingratiating himself with the Antonines and the previous um, dynasty. Um, as a North African, he brought, in fact, an African religion to, uh, to the, his court. Uh, he worshipped the deity, uh, the Greco-Roman Egyptian god uh, uh, Serapis, and uh, also Apis the Bull, uh, who was, uh, was worshipped in the great uh, necropolis in uh, Saqqara, Egypt. In 192 to 202, he worked hard to re-annex bring Mesopotamia back into the Roman fold. And he finished out his years in, of all places, in Britain, uh, dying in Eboracum, the ancient Eboracum, which is now the modern city of York. And here are some, co uh, a coin, both the recto and the verso, showing us uh, a portrait of Septimius Severus. And here are other uh, bus portraits of him, uh, one on the left in Rome and the other one on the right in Boston. Uh, as you can see, a relatively recognizable portrait of the man, a consistent image of this bearded uh, emperor. 
Uh, one of his greatest constructions, actually, or monuments dedicated to Septimius Severus, uh, was built or uh, uh, built in uh, around the year 200 to 203. It was dedicated in 203, at least that's what the inscription tells us. Uh, and it is the fabulous, the fantastic arch that you see there on the left, just below the Capitoline Hill. And in this image, we're actually uh, sitting, we're actually on the Capitoline Hill, looking down into the Roman Forum, and there we can see the arch of Septimius Severus on the left. Here's another view from the Palatine Hill, so then opposite uh, the arch. Uh, actually, no, I, excuse me, this is also from the Capitoline Hill, only from the right of it. We were just looking at it from the left, looking back at the Roman Forum. But there is that spectacular arch, which has survived since the early uh, third century um, AD. And I'm showing you these two diagrams because they show us the kind of prominent location of this archway. And here I'll use my cursor to point out that that is the arch of Septimius Severus. There you see it from above, uh, kind of aerial view. So this is the Roman Forum here, uh, the Via Sacra coming through, the Temple of Julius Caesar, the Temple of the Antonines here. And then in order to ascend the Capitoline Hill, you have to go either to the right or to the left. In this case, as you go to the right, you actually enter through the arch, or you used to enter through the arch of Septimius Severus to ascend the Capitoline Hill, the all important Capitoline Hill with the Temple of Zeus up above. And there you see the prominent location of that archway right next to the, uh, the rostra, that is the platform where, from which the great ret, uh, uh, rhetoric, uh, rhetoricians, uh, the great orators of the Roman state would actually speak to the Roman people. The, these next images also show us that, uh, that prominent location. On the left, you see the archway with its quadriga or its, uh, its chariot with horses. And there was presumably an image of Septimius Severus atop that arch. Uh, here you see it again on the right side with the rostra to the left. So remember the rostra was this podium that had the rostrum or that this is the prows of these famous ships destroyed by the Roman Navy uh, in battle, in sea battles. And these are two configurations of what um, historians believe, archaeologists, historians believe the rostrum uh, the rostra looked like at the time of the uh, the construction of this um, this magnificent archway. In this image, you have it as an open space with a with a balust, uh, baluster around it. Uh, in this case, you have these um, uh, monuments or columns with statues atop. Um, we don't know precisely what was on the rostrum at the time of Septimius Severus. And here you see the archway from a distance. This, this view is indeed from the Palatine looking back at it. Of course, it would not have been as visible uh, back then as it is today because there would have been buildings in the way, rooftops and that sort of thing. But nevertheless, it was a very, very important location. And again, this is the same view uh, in, this, uh, in this modern reconstruction, this digital reconstruction of, the, uh, of that beautiful archway at the foot of the Capitoline Hill uh, and just be ahead of the the stairs that led one up uh, to the right above it. Also notice that there's a very important uh, building to the right of it, and that's the building that you see here today and you see in the reconstruction here, and that is the Curia. And the Curia was the, the space, the traditional place where the Senate met. I'm going to show you these two interesting images because they show us a little bit of the archaeology or the history of this uh, of this archway and how it has survived. The print on the left uh, from around the year 1500, so it's a Renaissance print, a high Renaissance image by a Frenchman by the name of Etienne du Perrassin. And Perrassin gives us an image of the ancient Curia as it looked in the, uh, in the Renaissance, so around 1500. And you can see much of it is in fact still under, underground from the rubble of the, uh, the, de the destroyed uh, Roman capital. But the same thing is true of the archway on the left. Much of it is visible, but about a fourth of it is underground, uh, as you can see there. Um, the base and the platform upon which this, um, this uh, structure stood was um, for most of the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance underground. And that was excavated uh, as late as the 19th century, uh, the late 19th century. Um, this is an image of that, uh, a wonderful photograph uh, from around 1850. So it's a very, very early photograph 
of the Arch of Septimius Severus as it appeared in the middle of the 19th century. It was dug up, or at least the ground around the base was removed so that you can actually see the original base and the original uh, path that led through the arch. By the way, uh, today they discourage uh, uh, visitors from going through the arch. You actually have to go around it uh, uh, to ascend uh, to the Capitoline Hill. Uh, but you can still see the, the really remarkable and beautiful carving, the richness uh, of the carving of that impressive archway. So unlike previous emperors who had built fora in uh, imperial fora, very large open spaces, basilica, libraries, columns, that sort of thing, what we have from Septimius Severus is a major archway. And of course, that, that extols his virtues as a military man, as a general. Remember, he came into power by actually fighting uh, and winning a civil war. Uh, but he also, but what is celebrated here are his campaigns against the Parthians, that is, um, uh, enemies, uh, traditional enemies of the Roman uh, Empire. And in fact, in that base that was obscured um, after the destruction of the city, for so many, many centuries, what we actually see are reliefs of these captive Parthians. And these are the individuals that you see here wearing these funny little caps. And those funny little caps are known as Phrygian caps. And the Phrygians were a tribe that uh, opposed the Romans. They actually opposed autocracy. Um, they are kind of uh, heroes of democratic traditions. And here you see a Parthian there in the center of the enemies of Septimius Severus and the Roman state wearing that funny Phrygian cap. That cap, by the way, has made it into modern iconography. Uh, for example, you see it here in the fabulous painting by Eugène Delacroix, uh, Liberty Leading the People from 1830. The figure, that, that central figure, that allegory of that woman who represents uh, um, liberty, the, the ideals of democratic uh, revolution. Uh, she represents the, the French nation in modern times. Uh, with the tricolor, the famous uh, uh, French fl revolutionary flag, she is wearing this red Phrygian cap borrowed from uh, Roman times. Uh, therefore, she represents the, uh, the ideals of democracy over against the ideals of autocracy. So it's, a, it's an image borrowed from the Romans, uh, but, uh, but it's a subterfuge of Roman values during the imperial age. So the Arch of Septimius Severus in Rome is certainly a major and marvelous monument um, from that uh, period of imperial uh, power. Uh, but there are others. For example, this one is in his hometown. Uh, this is a magnificent archway. It actually doesn't have a single or even a tripartite entry uh, through it, but it actually is, uh, is a building that actually has four entrances and it can be entered from four, from uh, two, uh, two axes or two uh, major directions, actually four major directions. And this is the Arch of Septimius Severus in Leptis Magna, his hometown in modern day Libya today. Uh, there are fragments of other monuments from the long reign of Septimius Severus. For example, this is, uh, these are fragments uh, from the Arch of the Argentari, as the Italians uh, call it today. This was an arch dedicated in 204, again, during the period of, the, during the reign of Septimius Severus. And this was an arch that was dedicated by the bankers and cattle merchants of Rome and built in the Forum Boarium. The, uh, the arch doesn't exist any longer, but, it is, uh, but its fragments have been incorporated into a modern, a medieval a church, as a matter of fact. Um, and I want to show you some, before we leave the rule of Septimius Severus, I want to talk a little bit about his, uh, his spouse, Julia Domna. And as I mentioned, she was born in Homs, Syria, this, uh, this magnificent city, which unfortunately has been much destroyed by the current uh, Syrian civil war. She came from a very important family, an aristocratic family in this Roman uh, province. Um, she was the daughter of the high priest of Baal, who was a, uh, a, an ancient uh, uh, deity in, uh, in Mesopotamia, a solar god, uh, a Mesopotamian sun god. Um, he was known as Baal or Elagabal. Um, and we will see that name now appear among uh, Roman uh, aristocrats and, uh, and certainly the imperial household. 
Uh, she married Septimius Severus in 187 and had two sons, Geta and Caracalla. In 2017, um, she apparently committed suicide when her son uh, Caracalla was assassinated. So again, these um, uh, the Severans uh, 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 understood and knew uh, violence in that in their uh, in their court as well. Here are uh, coins showing us Julia Domna, and I don't know if you'll notice, but there is a very distinctive hairdo here now, which is characteristic of Severan um, hairstyles. Um, during the rule of Julia Domna and Septimius Severus. And these are bust portraits, again, with that uh, very interesting uh, hairdo um, or coiffure uh, in both of these portraits. And these come to us from the northern provinces up in Germania. Uh, this comes from the Römisch Germanisches Museum in, uh, in Cologne, Cologne, uh, Germany. Uh, there's another wonderful, uh, this is a cameo, and there are a number of cameos from this rain. Uh, this one is in barrel, this beautiful blue glassy stone. Uh, and this is a portrait of Julia Domna, again, with that very distinctive hairdo parted in the middle and then turned uh, and then braided a large braid in the front that then wraps around in the back. Uh, a very distinctive image of Julia. And here is, in fact, uh, one of her sons. This is Geta, Publius Septimius Geta, who was born in 189. And he co-ruled uh, in 211, after, uh, uh, after Septimius Severus's death, he co-ruled with his brother Caracalla. But, um, but it was a very short rule for Geta, because be uh, he only ruled between February and December of 211. And at the end of that year, Caracalla had his brother murdered. Uh, and these are some images of Geta as a young boy. These are from around 195. There's the, uh, the, the, uh, the infant Geta on the left, and there we see him in a coin on the right. Uh, an image of him as a late teenager at about the time that he assumed the throne, at about the time of Septimius's death. Uh, there's this wonderful cameo in Paris at the Bibliothèque Nationale, and uh, this is an, uh, a dual portrait of Geta and Caracalla, the two men who are facing each other. And I, I find that very curious because they did indeed become ultimately rivals, uh, Caracalla becoming the, the successor or the victor of that rivalry. You have to ignore the, the setting because this is a much, much later a Baroque setting uh, given to this ancient uh, Roman cameo. Uh, so the setting is probably from the 16th, if not the 17th centuries. I'm not quite sure about that. But the, uh, the Sardonyx cameo actually comes from around 203. So, um, so the, the two brothers facing, uh, facing off. And there's this wonderful uh, portrait from the early 20th century. This is by the, uh, the British painter Sir Lawrence Amatadema, and here it's a fanciful reconstruction of an event in the, uh, the, the Great Colosseum, the Flavian Amphitheater, and we see the Severan household with Julia Domna seated there in the lower right looking back at us in this wonderful oil painting, and uh, we see Geta being uh, favored or lionized by the crowds, uh, stepping forward, uh, and then in the distance the figure that you see there uh, leaning against the column, sort of brooding, is Caracalla. And of course, Caracalla will uh, assume the, ultimately will assume the throne as the single uh, heir, uh, emperor. But even more interesting than this modern reconstruction that we see in uh, Lawrence Almatadema's painting is this ancient painting that comes to us from Egypt. And this was done sometime between 193 and 211, showing us the house of Septimius Severus. So there on the right is the emperor himself crowned the bearded emperor, uh, already graying in this wonderful portrait. And on the left, we have Julia Domna with her distinctive hairdo and her beautiful jewelry. And in front of them are the two sons, Geta and Caracalla. But one thing that you'll notice that's very interesting is that somebody has been literally rubbed out. The portrait of Geta has been erased. Uh, and that can only have happened after 211, uh, after the, uh, the ascent of Caracalla as the new emperor. This is an amazing document to the, uh, the internal warfare, the internal strife that was taking place at court uh, between rival factions and rivals within uh, the, the royal household. So the successor to Geta is Caracalla, and Caracalla is one of those emperors who has a very, very bad rap from history. Um, he was born Bassianus Antoninus, 
Marcus Aurelius Antoninus Caracalla. Often these emperors have many, many names. Often they gain names as they, uh, they assume power. But in this case, uh, he is known as Caracalla. And by the way, Caracalla refers to a hood. It refers to the garment that he preferred wearing. It was, it was one of the hoods that was worn by the rival Gauls um, and uh, Caracalla, bar, uh, that was a nickname, if you will, that he took on. He was, in fact, born in Gaul. He was born in Lyon, um, uh, in what is now modern-day Lyon, France, uh, in the ancient Lugdunum. Um, in 202, he married a woman by the name of Plautila. And if you uh, remember from one of the earlier slides, Plautila was actually the daughter of Plautianus, who was in fact prefect of the Praetorians under Septimius Severus. So Septimius elevated Plautianus to this role of controlling the Praetorian guard, that personal guard of the emperor. And Plautianus was the man to do that. And his daughter was then married to Caracalla. Very brief co-rule with his brother, whom he en uh, whose life ended in his murder. And in, tw uh, in 212, um, Caracalla, in consolidating his power, also murdered Plautianus. So again, there's a lot of murder in this family. Plautilla, Plautianus' daughter, would wind up uh, exiled and also executed by Caracalla. So Caracalla was a bit of a thug, and that is indeed how history has remembered him. Uh, Dio Cassius tells us that he murdered 20,000 individuals in his reign, and he himself died by the sword in the year 217. So barely six years into his rule, uh, Caracalla, would, his life would end in, uh, in assassination. So here are some portraits of him as a young man. Uh, this is a wonderful image of him that comes from the House of the Vestals. So it comes from the Roman Forum, and it dates to about 200, maybe earlier than that. And then the image on the right, uh, currently now in Iowa in the United States, this is him as an uh, as the ruler. And this is indeed how history has remembered him. In fact, the finest portrait of Caracalla, in my opinion, is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in uh, New York City. And that is uh, the brooding, uh, an individual who's clearly uh, very serious about his role and um, quite a kind of malignant looking pose there, or at least uh, a physiognomy. So um, a, a brooding, uh, tempestuous figure in Roman history. And there are coins that show him as a confident, uh, virile, uh, aggressive individual. And you see that uh, in these uh, likenesses in the coins as well. Uh, there's a, another uh, 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 cameo image. So a carved in profile like a coin, only in this case on glass. Uh, in this case on amethyst, uh, the stone amethyst. Uh, more bust portraits of, again, very consistent image of the thug emperor Caracalla. Now, um, Caracalla is certainly known from his portraits and known from his reputation as one of these uh, uh, belligerent emperors, um, but, um, but he's also known for his constructions, and in a minute we'll talk about that. There are also images of Plautilla, his wife, and there you see a coin with her likeness. And, um, and now let's turn to Caracalla's constructions, uh, which are actually some of, some of the most impressive construction of the whole Severan dynasty. So as I, I've showed you this image before in earlier uh, discussions of the, uh, the, the, the growth of the Roman city, uh, the Roman capital, and there what, what, is, what is important about this image is it shows us, of course, the seven hills uh, and the, the walls that defended or guarded and protected that city, and also in color those aqueducts that brought fresh water into the city. And you'll notice that a number of those aqueducts end in important places like palaces, but also baths. And what you see in black here are a number of baths that were public amenities. They were used by the Romans on a regular basis, men and women, uh, places of pleasure and enjoyment and also of hygiene. And this is uh, the Romans were assiduous about personal hygiene and they took part in these public baths. Well, Caracalla built one of the most splendid bathhouses in ancient Rome, and there you see it in the lowest part of the, uh, of the screen, the Baths of Caracalla, with its own uh, aqueduct leading, bringing fresh water to these baths. Again, here's another map. This is, I believe, a, a Dutch map, so all the, all the names are transcribed into Dutch. But what you see there in red down below, below the Roman Forum, down below, 
the Palatine Hill is, are the baths of Caracalla. And those baths can be visited today. You can actually see the splendid ruins of this structure. Um, the structure. The, the, the building is a ruin and the whole complex, the grounds and the building themselves are in ruins. But what is impressive about them is the scale, the mammoth size of the buildings that we see there today. Um, and you can, only, you can only envision how much larger these baths were uh, when the roofs were on, when the grounds were fully uh, uh, available and accessible to uh, the Roman people. Um, the bath is a complex. It's a very, very large set of buildings, including a natatio, that is a swimming pool, um, cold water baths, a frigidarium, a tepidarium, sort of um, tepid water, and then the caldarium, hot water baths. Uh, and then it included also gymnasia, sort of the palestra, the gyms, the workout spaces, open courtyards for that, uh, ac those activities, and also a bunch of other things, gardens, lecture halls, libraries. In other words, this was a community center for the Romans. And there were many others in the city, but this was one of the most impressive ones built during the reign of Caracalla. And here you see um, what's left of those spaces. The marbles are gone. The mosaics are there in part, only on the floors. Uh, but the marbles and the vaults and certainly much of the statuary and the adornment of this fantastic complex is virtually gone. Um, this uh, is a reconstruction. It's a 19th century image of what the baths look like with its beautiful coffered vaults, uh, beautiful windows allowing light into the space, reveted marble panels on the walls, beautiful marble columns, Corinthian capitals, uh, et cetera, et cetera. These spaces were glorious. And interestingly enough, one of the places where you can experience not just the proportions, but also the magnificence of these spaces is in modern train stations. In the late 19th century and in the early 20th century, a number of grand uh, train stations were built uh, in the Western world, particularly in the United States and in Western Europe. And some of these train stations still evoke the architecture of the ancient Roman baths. And part of that was the result of the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris, the, the School of Higher Arts teaching ancient Roman architecture, and in some ways reconstructing those buildings in drawings and plans and teaching that architecture to its students in the 19th and early 20th century. And then those students going forth in the developed Western world and building um, buildings in the, in the guise. And they did a number of civic buildings, particularly train stations in, um, in with the scale, the proportion and the ornament of what architects and archeologists in the 19th century assumed was true of the ancient baths. Here is a view of modern day baths in Rome and a reconstruction from the 19th century on the left. There were fountains, sculptures, um, uh, beautiful pavements, as you see here uh, throughout uh, these, um, these marvelous bath buildings. Okay, um, this famous statue of Hercules, this is known as the weary or the tired Hercules or Heracles, um, uh, was uh, found at the Baths of Caracalla. So this is actually a sculpture that comes from the complex. And as you can see, a sculpture like this, which by the way, was a Roman copy of an ancient Greek statue. A statue like this was placed in a bathhouse to celebrate the beauty of the human body and the athleticism of, uh, of, of heroes, of athletes and uh, uh, both ancient Greek and Roman. So Caracalla was murdered and his short reign came to an end and he was succeeded, succeeded by Macrinus, Marcus Opelius Macrinus, who again is another uh, African um, um, ruler. He was born in Caesarea, in the city of Caesarea, in Mauritania, so in North Africa. And he came, apparently came from humble parentage, unlike his, predece his African predecessors who came from um, elite families or uh, patrician families. He engineered the murder of Caracalla um, when he was in fact prefect of the Praetorians at Edessa, now in modern day Turkey. So again, the Praetorians had a hand in, uh, in, in, in the killing of Caracalla. He ruled between 217 and 18 with a co-ruler. This was a child emperor by the name of uh, Diadumanius, Diadumanius. Um, and he was ultimately uh, murdered by uh, Elagabalus, so a Syrian 
um, from the Severin family. So uh, in 218, his rule came to a close. Uh, here are some coins showing us Macrinus on the left and Dia Dumanius on the right, the boy emperor. So imagine these two individuals ruling together. Presumably, Dia Dumanius would ascend the throne after Macrinus was done, but neither one of, of them uh, lasted long on, on the Roman throne. Instead, Marcus Aurelius Antoninus Elagabalus, uh, known as Heliogabalus, uh, would come to the throne. He was born in 204 as Avitus Bassianus at Holmes. So he comes from uh, the family of Julia Domna um, and, um, uh, uh, and comes to rule in Rome. Uh, he was also the high priest of the cult of Baal or Elagabal, hence his name Heliogabalus. Um, Helio is, of course, the Roman name for the sun. Uh, and so, uh, so often instead of Elagabalus, you hear Helio Gabalus. Uh, he was the son of Julia Suamius and the grandson of Julia Mamai. Uh, here is this wonderful 19th century image uh, by uh, Simeon Solomon of Helio Gabalus as the high priest of the sun. Uh, and eventually from high priest, he then becomes a Roman emperor. He kills Macrinus in Antioch, Syria in 218. And then in 219, he comes to Rome and he brings the cult of Baal to Rome himself. He was not a popular emperor in Rome. And one of the reasons is that he rubbed the Romans the wrong way. It's not that the Romans were closed to foreign cults entering the capital city, but he replaced Jupiter, the cult statue of Jupiter as the supreme god of the Roman state with uh, Baal, the Syrian deity, the ancient Mesopotamian deity. And that, of course, uh, rubbed the Romans the wrong way. And they chafed under his rule and they chafed under this new religion that was imposed upon them. So he was also murdered in the year 222. So as you can see, the Severan dynasty is, uh, is afflicted with, um, with murders, assassinations, plots. Uh, they can't seem to hold on to, uh, to the throne as, uh, as Septimius Severus was able to do. Here's a wonderful image of the youthful, the young boy, Elagabalus. And here's a 19th century depiction by Sir Lawrence Amatadema. This is known as the Roses of Elagabalus. So Elagabalus, Elagabalus or Heliogabalus was, uh, uh, according to history, and again, take it with a grain of salt, a debauched individual. I think that's probably a response to the fact that he was a foreigner and that he brought with him the ways and the customs of Mesopotamia or the Near East to the Roman court. Uh, a marvelous, if fanciful, depiction of Eliagabalus. He was in turn followed by Marcus Aurelius Severus Alexander, known as Alexander Severus, uh, another African-born uh, emperor. He was born in Phoenicia, uh, and he came to Rome as a child and was adopted by his cousin Elagabalus, and it, his, his mother, Julia Mamai, who actually seems to have exerted the most influence at court, uh, during, certainly during his rule. Um, between 231 and 34, he fought the Persians and defeated uh, the Emperor Ardashir, the Persian Emperor. And in 234, he took his battles to uh, the Germanic lands, uh, defeating the Alemanni in Northern Europe. And he was subsequently murdered in 235, uh, presumably along with his mother by Maximius Thrax. Uh, and this was in an uprising in Mainz, Germany, uh, the ancient Maguntiacum, uh, the ancient Roman city in Germany. Um, so Maximius Thrax will bring that rule to a close. Here are some interesting images of Julia Mamai, um, his mother. Uh, again, we see the consistency of the hairdo uh, that after Julia Domna in the portraits of Julia, Julia Mamai, who seems to have been the power or the force behind the throne um, of Alexander uh, Severus. Uh, and here are some portraits of Alexander Severus as a youth, some beautiful images. Uh, actually, this is one image in uh, the Louvre in Paris. Here's another one on the left in the Capitoline Museum in Rome uh, with a scant bit of a beard on this, uh, on this boy emperor. Uh, and then we'll end our lecture with this colossal image of him, a rather idealized colossal portrait, much destroyed or much uh, uh, eroded 
of Alexander Severus, the last of the Severan emperors. And with that note, we'll finish our discussion, we'll close our discussion, and we'll pick up with the uh, Maximius Thrax in our next presentation. Take good care, and uh, don't forget to like us on YouTube.